So again, just huge welcome. Um, excited to see all of you coming in. Uh, welcome, get yourself settled. Uh, we're going to be talking about some things that carry emotional weight uh, and bring up fear, bring up uh, tragedy, loss, sadness, grief, hope, resilience. And so in that spirit, I just want to invite you to just put your feet on the ground and just steady yourself. One of the most important things that I hear humans do is breathe. And so I just want to invite you to come in with breath and groundedness. I'm really excited to have all of you here uh, from Canada, from Switzerland, from Malawi, from Uganda, from uh, Kenya, from UK, from Philippines, from Wales, India, Bangladesh. Uh, sorry if I missed your country, uh, the place that you're from, but just welcome all of you. Uh, Brazil, um, welcome everyone. Uh, and today we're going to get to have uh, this conversation about repairing and resisting, uh, organizing after climate impacts. And uh, I just want to say, if I look or any of any of our, our speakers look a little bit tired, some of us are a little exhausted. For me, this is my, I think the 17th session, I'm bad at counting. But I think this is the 17th session that we've hosted uh, of different training skills uh, during this week. Um, so we're, some of us are a little tired. I, I'm a little tired. Um, but we're going to get to talk about uh, repairing and resisting. And so uh, we're going to hear a little about um, uh, from several different speakers uh, through the day. So I just want to um, start. We're going to hear from uh, three different people who are on deck to to share with us some stories, some kind of let's just call them like case studies or, or examples of work they've been doing about uh, handling, organizing uh, in the context of dealing with climate impacts. Um, and so, if I struggle with names, uh, just forgive me ahead of time. Um, but Bugra, Bugra, how close am I uh, to that to your name? Uh, is coming from Akiaka, which has worked. I'm really excited about this. They've been dealing with wildfires in Turkey. And so they've created a volunteer crew uh, to be in response to deal with both the immediate impact, but also some of the longer term impacts from the wildfires that, uh, that have been happening there. And uh, they've just been doing some very interesting organizing. Um, Hilda, uh, comes to us from Uganda. She's been working with uh, Fridays for Future, uh, the founder actually of Uganda's Fridays for Future. Um, and my colleagues Johnson and, and Nico are, are just wild fans. Many of us are wild fans, uh, Hilda, of the work that you've been doing. Um, and then Nemo Bassi, who's a uh, very well known, very um, respected uh, activist, originally an architect. Is that right? You're originally an architect. And but has founded Environmental Rights Action, has been involved in many, many different projects, um, and is just a, a very impressive human being um, and someone who we've respected for, for quite a long time. So uh, just really excited um, uh, for, for all of those. One request I have for you on this session is if you have questions, um, or things that are on your mind about, uh, like when you're coming into a session like this, you might have some things you're looking for or kind of hearing, like what, what could the, they speak to your condition? I just like to invite you to really think about those and just to put them on the chat or to put them on the question and answer. Um, but to share, what are some of the things that you're curious or you're looking for? Um, and, uh, and so, uh, for example, um, for me, I, I live in Philadelphia. I live on land that used to be from the Lenape uh, a long time ago, which is right next to the Delaware River. And in this last year, my neighborhood has flooded twice. Uh, we've had a flood sufficient so that I could take a canoe and paddle to my neighbor's homes. And uh, that has been, it had a low loss of uh, property and, and no one got hurt, thankfully. Um, but it, it got my neighbors in a, in a in pr more prepared 
for uh, we we need to take take this both more seriously, but also we need to begin building up our berm and being practical um, and also thinking about how do we check in with each other. And one of the questions on my mind is, I'm curious, how do we do more than just surviving? Um, how do we uh, not just be in a reaction mode, but also what kind of things do we need to prepare for? And so uh, getting more ideas about how people are responding to some of these climate disasters um, and also he handling our, our internal fear and, and so forth. Um, and, uh, and I've been thinking about this just as climate impacts, there's a, a number of different impact, different ways. And this is a framework I learned from Gopal that, that there are shocks these like moments of an ex of, a, of a sharp sudden disruption. Uh, for example, the deep water horizon oil spills or the typhoon Yolanda or Haiyan or, or many, many other others like that. These shocks that are increasing in frequency as climate change is uh, accelerating uh, the way that our, our globe has been working. And then there's the, these slides, which are sometimes a little bit slower to observe they're incremental by their nature. Uh, they can be catastrophic, but they're not always experienced all at the same time or not as cute. So uh, sea level rise is a, is a slide. Rising employment is a slide. The rising cost of food and energy can be experienced as a slide. Sometimes there's moments where it jumps, but, but I mentioned all of this, this around shocks versus slides and that there's different ways we're responding to different kinds of the impacts. And so today we'll hear a lot about some of the different shocks in particular, but we'll also address some of the different, different slides as well. And I just wanted to mention, this is for me, uh, the anniversary of uh, the flood, one of the floods I mentioned, um, and a group that uh, I just want to honor a group earthquake reaction team that I'm part of here in Philadelphia. And they organized a banner drop. What you're looking at right now, um, that's a highway that got completely flooded uh, last year. And so uh, it was completely underwater. And so this group earthquake reaction team wanted to highlight this. Uh, and they had a target Pico, uh, which is the energy utility company who has done nothing to sort of deal with climate change. And so they were just taking this moment uh, to address, to, to kind of raise the issue. So I just wanted to honor, uh, it's a one year anniversary and actually some of my colleagues right now were, are going out and gonna do the, another banner drop again um, to address this issue uh, of, of putting pressure for climate change. So we're gonna get to hear from a bunch of stories. Um, I'm excited to hear from, from all the folks here. Um, I do wanna say two things. Uh, I made two mistakes uh, already and I just wanna acknowledge, um, I wrote Nemo's name wrong, sorry about that Nemo. Um, and, and also neglected to talk about Nemo's uh, currently working with Health of Mother Earth Foundation home, um, which has its head office in Nigeria. Um, and so we'll, we'll get to, they'll get to share more about some of the work that they've been up to. And, Many of you have been aware uh, of a big climate impact that's happening right now. So in a moment, we'll get to hear from some of the people I just mentioned talking about the work that they've been doing that's been, uh, had, had the space of time to do reflection on what, what worked and what's valuable and what the lessons are that they've gotten out of it. Um, but we also wanna acknowledge that Pakistan has had a gigantic flood right now. Um, and so we're, in the range of 10,000 plus people have passed away and uh, have died from this flood. One in seven people have been uh, uh, made internal refugees uh, because of the se severity of it. And so Shabayan, who's 350's uh, South Asia organizer, um, has been working with it. So I, I just want to invite you, Shabayan, to just bring us a, a little bit of a word about where people, where things are, and to just share a little bit about that right now. So Shabayan, if you don't mind um, coming off of mute so you can yeah. share just to bring a word. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. And uh, thanks to Daniel for inviting me to this call. Um, 
and as Daniel mentioned that um, there's a gigantic flood like this is um, is it a climate change in, induced flood if I can say uh, that's devastated Pakistan it's currently still going on and it, it, the current status is basically that 33 million people are displaced that's if you look at the numbers that's one in every seven Pakistani and these are not people whose homes and lives got destroyed. This is 33 million people uh, whose future is also destroyed uh, because we know that uh, the after effects of flood, uh, post flood reconstruction, it's a long way wor uh, work uh, in the country and it takes ages to build what we have just lost. Um, and we all know that who is responsible uh, because Pakistan's per capita emission is the lowest. Um, but I will actually ask, I see that there are a lot of folks here from um, many different parts of the world. Um, I will actually ask you to, and I also see that there is somebody from Pakistan. Thanks for joining, brother. Um, and we have been working with communities and our partners in Pakistan. And one of our partners, Anam Rathor, she wrote a very important blog uh, about what's happening and what's the status right now. I invite you to read that blog and share uh, after the call, of course. And um, here's the link, I pasted it. And I see a lot of folks from around the world, from global north countries. I urge you to pressure your government to do more because um, for climate preparations and also to funding the loss and damage fund, which they keep on delaying. And also that if you can, or if you can share, you can also share this uh, fundraiser spreadsheet. There are a lot of different local groups that's fundraising to keep, keep uh, you know, in terms of keeping materials reaching the, you know, worst uh, impacted communities, um, sanitary care, um, groceries. So these are all local NGOs. The money will go to impact those communities. Yeah, that's all from me, Daniel. Great. Thank you, Shabayan, for your work, for your energy, and for uh, sharing your um, uh, what's going on in, in real time right now. Uh, this is a situation that's very much unfolding. So I, I ask everyone to, as you can, share those links and and uh, do as as Shabayan suggesting of putting pressure on our governments to to do what they can to really address this because uh, this is this is a moral outrage and this is the. This is, in some ways, the beginning of what of of the catastrophic phase uh, that climate change is bringing to more and more of our communities. So I want to turn it to uh, Bugra to speak first um, to share with us about the work that you've been doing with uh, Akiaka. And you don't know, but I've been watching Akiaka for some time, and uh, I'm. So excited to uh, hear from you talking about the work that you've been doing. So thank you. So I won't set it up much more except to say, I think you've got some slides. Go for it. Sorry. Hold on, we're just having a technical thing. Bugra, I think that you need to select your language as English if you're gonna present in English uh, on the globe. Got it? I don't think we still hear him, right? Great. Uh, so, <laughs> we're going to pause you uh, and just give you a minute to uh, get your audio together. So, we'll work on that in a second. Um, and so, Neem, I'm, I'm going to just lean on you, if that's all right, uh, to go next. Um, and so, the setup here is, is 
what are some of the different ways that folks have been handling climate impacts? So we'll, we'll give you 15, 25 minutes to kind of share some of your contact stories uh, in terms of how, how are people adjusting? And, and the theme here, again, the theme has been, how do we deal in the moment of climate impacts as like Shabayan is, is dealing with and other folks in Pakistan, but also how do we do more than just be in reaction mode to the impacts that are coming, but also take, take that next step, bring people into that next thing. So how do we deal with climate disaster, but also still organize, still bring people, not just from, not just from, oh, we should build a berm to protect my neighborhood, but we should get with other people to begin protecting whole communities. And even more than that, we should be dealing with the climate ish, uh, climate context altogether. And so that that trajectory of bringing people into not just reaction survival, but beyond that. So uh, Nemo, thank you for joining us and uh, we're excited to hear your word. Thank you so much, Daniel and uh, Bugra. I'm sorry that I had to take your space at this time, <laughs> uh, but it's fine. I'll be brief and uh, I'm really glad that so many people signed on to this very important uh, gathering. Uh, I will be sharing some slides and uh, I hope to, I may not follow the methodology that Daniel just laid out, but um, I, I would like us to just give a flavor of what the confrontation is for us, what the situation is for us in the face of climate change and how it's connected to human rights abuses and environmental injustices, as well as all the harms you can think about. And the first slide I'm showing is from the Niger Delta, which is the oil belt of Nigeria, where the multinational oil companies have been operating for the past 64 years plus. And this little boy is fetching water from a very polluted well because the rivers in the communities are already very polluted. And now I thought I should also share this, uh, this map that shows the distribution of impacts of climate impact around the world. And you can see that it's restricted to a particular segment of the world. And this happens to also be the, the segment that contributes the least to the problem. So this actually amplifies the, the, the fact of climate injustice in the world today. Um, 350 have done a lot of work on this. And uh, so I'm just being wrong. I believe many of us are very well acquainted with what is going on, but the impacts that we have in Africa to a large extent is heightened by extractivism. Uh, of course, you know, the continent has faced the extractivist onslaught right from, from many, many centuries ago, from slavery, from colonialism, neo-colonialism to the present petroleum civilization extractivism that is ongoing. So we're having sea level rise. One of the slides that, slides that Daniel was talking about, uh, sea level, for according to the last intergovernmental panel uh, on climate change report, the sea level rise around Africa is almost inevitable, is ongoing, and it's not going to stop in, in the near future if you stop at all. This has impact, not just sea level rise as a notion, but it's actually uh, eating up coastal communities, coastal land, displacing people, and causing conflict. Uh, in a place like Senegal, uh, the sea level rise is also being accompanied by destruction of the soil in case of salinization. And so you have farmers who cannot fish, who cannot farm, who prefer one now to turn into fishing, but the sea is also less productive for a number of reasons, including, of course, uh, salinization and sea level rise and loss of species. Overfishing is another, another factor and all kind of illegal activities going on in the waters around Africa. In Nigeria, one other challenge is desertification, uh, which is happening in the Sahel. There's water stress across the region, we're having unusual floods, uh, uh, maybe not at the magnitude of what we see in Pakistan currently, but really disastrous floods as what we've also heard about in Mozambique in, and, and that region. So displacement is a big problem that is not easy to deal with. And unfortunately, in climate change discussion, we're, still, we're not hearing about Climate, we hardly hear about climate refugees. People are still, talk, still talking about um, migration or forced migration. But really, if we call them climate refugees, 
they stand a better chance of being receiving some attention. Um, now, the, the other problem that I should speak about before I run into other the talk about how people are resisting is the fact that now that the world is increasingly aware that we have to keep the fossil fuels in the ground, uh, we are seeing more investment in Africa. And this is potent, it's pushing towards more crisis, more climate crisis, more climate impact, and destroying the resilience that have been built up over the years. The war in Europe is not helping things because as Russia turns up the gas tap, European countries, the EU is focusing on Africa and other regions for, for more gas, for more of the same thing that they should be torn away from. And so um, the last check, the oil, oil companies are planning to sink up to 230 billion in the next one decade and $1.4 trillion into fossil fuel projects by 2050. Now that is a recipe for the grave for, the, for horrors. Uh, I'm sure you're going to hear more about the East African uh, crude oil pipeline, so I will not dwell on this, but it's also one of the one of the examples of what is going on today. When the world should be shutting down fossil fuels, we're having more infrastructure. Uh, the war in Europe is also bringing to life the idea of building a pipeline from, from Nigeria to Morocco with the whole as, as reason, purpose of sending the gas to Europe. This is really horrible. And it's going to have negative effects on fisheries, on the livelihoods of coastal communities, and the coastal communities, I can assure you, would not benefit from, from this project. So it's everything about colonial extraction, colonial exports, and the same old paradigm ongoing around here. Now, so we're having, we're having climate change as sea level rise, salinization of water, desertification, floods, droughts, uh, impacts on agriculture. But sometimes we forget to look at the two ends of the pipeline. One end is where extraction is taking place. The other end is where the fossil fuels are being utilized. Now, a whole lot of fossil fuels is extracted in the Gulf of Guinea, uh, in, in where Niger, the Niger Delta is located, has seen massive pollution in the entire Gulf of Guinea. And this has a lot of impact, many, many serious impacts on how people can uh, survive the impacts of global warming. So you're having the attack from two ends, um, two ends of the pipeline from the use and from the extraction. Now, if you also think about Mozambique, there's a lot of conflict in northeastern uh, of Mozambique in Cabo Delgado area. And the last one we heard about, we heard about cyclones increasingly in that region. Uh, I apologize for having over 1,000 lives written in this slide. It's actually over 3,000 lives were lost in Cyclone Idai that hit Mozambique and Tanzania in 2019. And every year since then, there's been other, other cyclones. And, and yet in the same region, northeastern part of Mozambique, where gas has been found, companies and the government are investing in infrastructure to get that gas to Europe. And because of the violence that is generated, you have massive uh, regional forces being sent in there to pacify the people. So these are some of the things that, they, that we don't really discuss often we talk about climate change impacts. Climate change impacts beyond the geographic things, is beyond the, what the science is saying. It's about lives of people at risk on a daily basis. And I'll come down to what is going on in the Niger Delta. Niger Delta is one of the top 10 most contaminated places on earth. Why? Because this is where oil and gas is, has been extracted with total responsibility over so many years now, since 1956, uh, without anything uh, better. The picture here is the first oil well that was drilled in 1956. Uh, commercial export began in 1958, 64 years ago. And what we can have, uh, what we have around the entire region is nothing other than ecocide. It's massive degradation that could, uh, cannot imagine uh, having this abated within the within our lifetime, uh, it's just a pipe dream to think that we can tackle this. But you know, the fight is ongoing to stop the horror and then begin the cleanup. The slide I'm showing here all illustrate kind of gas flaring that we have in the region. Sometimes in the middle of communities, sometimes in the forest, in farmlands, and this pumping millions of tons of toxic. Uh, gases to the atmosphere, causing asthma, bronchitis, blood disorders, bed defects, all kinds of cancers and diseases in communities 
uh, facing uh, having living in this uh, where, where this assault is taking place. So we're having what you can best describe as environmental racism, what you can heighten inequality, gender discrimination, and pure neocolonialism. Now, I shared a slide of a place in Ogoniland, which is one of the emblematic parts of the Niger Delta, where cleanup of the mess is being, has been commenced. By the time the United Nations Environment Program uh, conducted a research on the environmental degradation in this area, some places were found to have hydrocarbon pollution to a depth of five meters. When the cleanup began in NS a couple of years back, in some of the same location was found that the hydrocarbon pollution has gone as far down as five meters, some places as deep as 15, 15 meters, 10 to 15 meters. So as long as this pollution are left unattended to, they, they're so long they get more complicated, the situation gets more complex and more difficult to deal with. And let me say that at the moment, all major transnational oil companies who have created this, who, who has carried out extraction in very criminal ways in the Niger Delta are currently embarking on what they term divestment. Now divestment in the United States or in Northern uh, in, in Europe are completely different from the one we're facing in Nigeria. While activists in US campaign for an end to the, for divestment, for investment in this dirty energy sector in Nigeria, after years of extreme pollution of the entire region, where life expectancy has dropped to 41 years on the average, oil companies like ExxonMobil, like Shell, are planning and trying to sell off the assets and just take their briefcases and their dollars and move away, leaving that mess. And the resistance that's building in the area, in the region, in the country, is that this corporation, we just, we want them to leave, but they have to pay up, they have to take care of the cleanup that is needed to restore the environment to a livable, livable territory. So the, our campaign is that the investment must go with responsibility. They can't offload the, the responsibility of their pollution on the poor communities and on local companies who are rising up to buy up the, 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 the shields from, from transnational oil companies. Uh, we think that this divestment is criminal and we require global action to join to support our local communities in the fight to hold these companies accountable for massive ecocide they've created. Now, I decided to share this slide so that you, there was a, a well blowout at a place called Roro One off, off the coast of Nigeria, the Niger Delta. This blowout happened in 2020, April, for more than two years now. It's still not been, the blowout has not been contained. It's still burning and still spilling. Uh, so you imagine from this location, just off the shores of, of a Niger Delta, millions of tons of greenhouse gases that uh, as a subjecting the climate change are being pumped into the atmosphere without anybody taking responsibility. So what are the people doing? There's a whole lot of resistance going back to the 1990s when Councillor we were the late uh, a minority rights and environmental rights activist who was executed in 1995 has led the Ogoni people. And from 1993, we were able to succeed in keeping the Ogoni oil in the ground in Ogoni land. And the struggle has been to duplicate and replicate that in other regions. And so the people have been embarking on direct actions, including naked action, the naked option, uh, which is a situation where elderly women go take off their tops and protest against the harms uh, of, of these uh, corporations who are driving global warming and who are denying that they are the ones responsible and who still go to the conference of parties and influence decisions that countries are, rather than facing out fossil fuels, are talking about facing down coal. Uh, the other means of resistance by the communities uh, to just have a, a kind of relief from the assault from these corporations and from the government is litigation. And there's been litigation, massive, many litigation going on in Nigerian courts as well as in courts outside of Nigeria. There's been landmark decisions in the Supreme Court in the UK holding Shell International accountable for what their subsidiaries do uh, in other places, including Ogoniland. There's a case, there was a case in, at The Hague against Shell also, where four farmers had sued for environmental uh, pollution and, and got 
positive, positive ruling from the court and they're now in the process of resolving that, that problem. Now, the other thing that we are involved in and which we do very frequently is a, a series of learnings and risings with sharing knowledge, building knowledge and exchanging, uh, having cultural exchanges, having exchanges in different ways. We have what we call all field dialogues where communities need a discussion about what were their hopes and uh, where these things happen and what are they, how are they re re responding to global warming, how they're responding to continuous pollution and what, how others can team up with them to resist. There's also a series that we call learning from the wise. Uh, the wise are those who are learning from those who are knowledge holders and uh, not just those who are old, the young people, and so but mostly young people sitting down to listen to the elders, to learn uh, the best ways to take care of the environment, the ecological defense, uh, and to be able to speak up as necessary and to rise up against uh, environmental uh, climate criminals. And then we're building teams of eco-defenders, community youths who, are, who have learned, uh, um, have skills in environmental monitoring, they can go around monitoring what is going on in the environment to before the corporations report what they've done. Uh, be, when there's any incident, it's already out there in the media from community monitors who are constantly on the lookout. And then on our own, we do, we have what we call there are different schools of ecology and learning places across the continent. In Nigeria, we call it schools of ecology, where we pick up particular topics like diversity, like climate change, like blue economy and have uh, defenders to begin to, to learn about this. In Uganda, uh, a group like NAPE has sustainability, sustainability villages. In Mozambique, Justica and Bienta runs every year what they call seeding climate justice. In South Africa, there's a climate justice school run by Groundwork. And so there are many groups across the continent who are building up knowledge, building up resistance, because the best resistance is resistance that is done with knowledge. So the webs are expanding. We are also working with fisher folks in the Fishnet Alliance, campaigning on fish, not oil, but fish employs more people. Fish fits the people, fish treats communities. Fish is part of the culture, part of the spirituality, uh, but extractive activities in the water bodies are very destructive for all this. In South Africa, it's called ocean, not oil. And activists and fishers in South Africa have been very, very successful in stopping Shell and other corporations from carrying out seismic activities off the coast of that country. There's also a network of resistance, a no, it's a no red in Africa network, no red as R-E-D-D, campaigning against the appropriation of forests and dislocation of communities from their resources. Uh, of course, there's also one, part, one uh, means of building resistance that I love so much, that is using the arts, using poetry for advocacy using mobile phones to make docu video documentaries for advocacy. And there's so many things. Then finally, um, two months ago, we hosted what we call the Niger Data Convergence, an idea that we hope to spread across the continent for everywhere there are extractive activities. I came up with the Niger Data Manifesto for Socioecological Transformation. And the key demands in that manifesto is that there must be environmental audit carried out in every location where extraction has been carried out. Uh, it's, it's ongoing or has been ongoing. Uh, and the whole idea is to map out the impacts, the climate impact, the all the related impacts, and also the health audits so that we know what is killing our people. The economic demands for clean jobs for the young people, security of facilities, uh, there's a need asking for a comprehensive receipt, uh, comprehensive review of a petroleum law that was just signed in Nigeria, then to halt deforestation, especially those of the mangroves and rainforest. And then of course, calling for mitigation uh, against an adaptation, climate change, and other political actions, but everything being guided by popular participation. Now, finally, 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 there's a saying that I love so much in the book, Climate Wars, why people will keep, be killed in the 21st century, written by Harald Welser. He said, it is not the objective circumstances themselves that determine how people behave, but the manner of their interpretation. And this is so profound. If we look at climate change as something that has colonial roots, that has racist roots, that builds inequality, that 
uh, is extremely harmful in different ways, culturally, spiritually. When we have this understanding of the poly crisis from all aspects, then we are able to see how urgent the situation is that we must act. So with this, I um, invite all of us to think and act, and we should do this right now. Thank you so much, Daniel. And thank Fantas you for paying attention to what I have to say. Fantastic, Nemo, thank you. Um, there's so much there, and, and I just wanna underline, uh, some people came in with a question, how do we deal with people who uh, their objective reality isn't, isn't seeing the issue of climate change. They're still in a kind of denialism about it. And as you say, just because we're experiencing climate change does not mean that we'll necessarily put the pieces together. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're going to, to understand the roots, the history. And so what are some of the uh, things that you are doing to help people uncover those roots so that they can sort of make connect the dots about climate change and deal with their own denialism. Yes, um, thank you for highlighting that. Um, one of the, somebody says that the best way to begin talking about warming is by build, sharing, building and sharing of knowledge about the crisis. Uh, and that is why I mentioned that sometimes people look only at one end of the pipeline, counting carbon molecules in the atmosphere and not looking at the the beginning of the pipeline where the crimes are being committed, the extractivist crimes. Uh, so we begin with all our efforts to bring the two ends together. And this is why we have so much, so many learning spaces at different levels, at community level, at academic level, at policy level. And we do a lot of exchanges. And sometimes we don't learn to go to the community, sit down quietly to hear from the people. Because sometimes activists tend to think that they have all the knowledge. Uh, we don't pay as much attention as we ought to when we find those who are actually impacted by, by this crisis. And uh, we, we put a lot into exchange visits. Recently, I was in with other uh, colleagues in Oil Watch Africa in Ghana. We're not just going there to watch the oil. We went to see present environment that will be destroyed when that country takes extractivism to do certain regions. And also talking with the officials about how they're already impacted by global warming. In the coming days, I'll be in a team going on a solidarity business somewhere else in Africa. So we're doing this continuously, learning from uh, what people are experiencing, building on that, and also researching. I've been a part of a research team building on uh, looking at climate change and conflict in the Gulf of Guinea, in the West African sub-region. And all this learning was from the communities, not from the classroom, not from the laboratory, but the actual laboratory of life, the lived experience of people. And from there, we're learning about how to take the actions forward and how to show that the Conference of Parties the, of the UNFCCC is not about solving the climate problem, it's about how to avoid action. And that's what we're going to see in Egypt in November this year. The countries will gather to debate how to avoid action. How could nations be taking voluntary action on something that needs global action determined by science? That's what we're trying to do all this, we bump this so that people are not taken by surprise when the storms keep coming. Because those who should do something and not do anything. Wonderful. Um, and one request uh, is coming in, Nemo. If you can share your slides, people are excited to use them. So thank you. All right, I'll certainly send them to you by email. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect, and we'll email those out for everyone. This is being recorded, and so people will send them out, both the slides and the recording, uh, for people to be able to connect um, afterwards. Thank you so much. And if people do have additional questions, I love that people are organizing on the chat and starting to connect with other people. And if people have other questions they want to put in, chat's a great way to do that. Um, so thank you for that. And we're going to see if we, Vugra, do we have you now? Yeah, let's try. Do we? Is it? Yes. yes. Fantastic. <laughs> um, so uh, Akiaka has been uh, doing work in Turkey uh, where there's been a, a series of different wildfires, uh, very large uh, wildfires that, that I'm, I'm sure you'll, you'll discuss and talk about. And, and they've been dealing with a very specific climate impact and, and organizing around it. And so a chance for us to hear about how you're 
working on climate disasters. I might jump in with some questions, but I, I know you also have a presentation in your mind. So go for it, Bugra. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. And let me share my screen here. Yes, I think it works now. Perfect. So yeah, uh, hi everyone. And um, I'm really honored to be here and to share our story and especially talking after Nemo is, thank you. And, um, and it's great to be here because to be here with the very diverse background people all over the world and basically the people who cares, who cares about the nature, who cares about the future generations. And even if we haven't met, I feel that connection. And my name is Ra, and I live in southwest of Turkey, and um, I've been a tech entrepreneur for uh, my career. And last six years, I co-founded a social innovation platform in Istanbul. And because of that, I worked with uh, impact investors, national, international nonprofits, corporates, and um, like issues such refugee crisis, youth unemployment, and equality. But to be honest, I was getting to the dark side, like the dark side of becoming of becoming a boring doomer. And um, but then. Um, the story that I'm going to share now, it changed all of my life. I moved to uh, southwest of Turkey during the pandemic in March 2020. And um, I was burned out. And Mediterranean Forest basically welcomed me with open arms. And in 2021, last summer, same forest changed my life by burning uh, like never before. And um, today I'm going to share the community-led disaster response and preparedness. But I want to start with uh, the answer. Like uh, the biggest learning from our experience was that disasters can be a leverage point to build uh, anti-fragile neighborhoods via these community-led uh, initiatives. And uh, it is also very transformative to witness in personal level as well. So um, I want to emphasize also anti-fragility here because I believe that we should aim for anti-fragility, not for resilience. If as Nassim Taleb mentioned in his book that if we can stand our current approaches to prediction, prognostication and risk manage management on their heads, we can transform humanitarian efforts such as disaster relief to regenerative development programs. So, and the second concept that I want to make in short introduction is this community-led part. Um, it's kind of like an umbrella term that is those who are already part of the local community who are affected and lives in that area. This definition distinguishes such as such responses from other types of localizations where international agencies support local actors to take uh, to undertake projects basically like so subcontracting because this kind of uh, Community-led organizations, they organize in a common goal at community level. So like where you don't have traditional extractive model of boss who has a lot of capital, then hire some managers and manage a bunch of people in a strict hierarchy. But community-based efforts are a bunch of people coming together who are, in our case, neighbors, essentially peers coming together and deputizing each other and figuring out how to make this work. And in modern Western societies, like we don't have that instinct uh, programming of being able to organize ourselves in those kind of uh, non-hierarchical ways. So we are much, much accustomed to that chain of, chain of command, like tell me, tell me what to do and what my part is 
And, um, but actually in Anatolia, we have this concept, this phenomena called uh, image. And uh, since the thousands of years, especially in the Ottoman Empire, uh, since the centralized government is not answering all of the requests and the needs of the locals, so village people develop this concept of collective, collective action towards the common challenges and the needs. So that concept, that separate was very crucial uh, in our story as And so what happens? I'm here because as Daniel mentioned that um, we had our uh, biggest forest fires in Turkey's history last year. And um, what started as just preparing for 200 sandwiches for the firefighters in region became this civil initiative that shifted our uh, relationships and most importantly, our perspective about what it means to be neighbor and what we can do about the future disasters and other issues that our regions, uh, region is affected by. And um, yeah, to put context, um, this, this is where I live now. Uh, and these four region was uh, affected by huge fires in just a couple of four days, starting simultaneously. And uh, Akyaka was basically in the middle of and best location for to become a logistic hub. And uh, we were both lucky and agile to put out the fires that happened in the region in uh, the first 30 minutes. So they didn't became, they didn't become a disaster. So we put our efforts to become a logistic hub for the region. Um, the, because of the magnitude of the disaster, the centralized organizations like failed to respond and lost their all effectiveness. It was like pure chaos on the field. And um, like the neglect of neglect and the misallocation of the resources. And for example, it turns out that Turkish government had not been entirely prepared for this and 85 million uh, population and we don't have even one single operational firefighting plane. They've been renting uh, three of them from Russia uh, to put context, compare that uh, Greece has 39 firefighting plane, planes in Greece. And the other coordination failure was that municipality who is responsible for the firefighting department, they didn't have any experience on the forest fires. I mean, they, their trucks were not even four-wheeled off ready. And also between these organizations, there are not any information flow, but to put perspective of the coordination failure, their fire hose equipments are not compatible with each other. So as these debates uh, over how the fire started and the government's lack of preparedness in fighting the uh, fires continued, but distributed self-starting initiatives uh, flourished all of the uh, fire affected areas. So we were one of them and we have built a bridge between the needs of the field and the donor, donors from all over the Turkey. And uh, we were able to source and distribute 35 uh, loads of trucks, aid material, and mobilize like thousands, uh, 1,000 volunteers uh, on the field. And um, like the way we did it was very organic. Like we didn't have uh, time to plan anything. So it was just happening. It was very emergent process. And um, once the fires uh, couldn't control and rapidly grow to the second day, we started to have open calls via social media, WhatsApp groups uh, to meet neighbors. And first we formed two teams. One 
for to visit the villages and talk to the neighbors. Since they've been dealing for forest fires for all their life, they have already experience and know-how. So we mined that insights. And the other team was responsible to the uh, uh, areas that affected by the fire to see and learn about the process and what are the missing parts and also getting contact information from the regions so that we can coordinate with them. So basically we collected the insights to tap in the local knowledge and seek advice from the experts. For example, like, okay, you need to buy fire extinguishers, but do we buy the chemical ones or do we buy the foam ones? We, we don't have any idea. So that was uh, very important. And then make decisions with collaborative input, but we didn't wait for consensus. It was basically what we were doing that if someone has insight and takes responsibility to see the jobs to be done, then they can take initiative. And once the project ready, ask for objections. Is there any objection for this project? and collect the feedbacks and decide and act. That's why it was very fast. And uh, to give more concrete example about this process, um, in the third day of the fires that we learned that uh, the village villages has these fire trailers, but only two of them have these uh, trailers. And village people said that, okay, we need these um, uh, trailers, and then one one of our team member find a suitable manufacturer that is going to be provided in two days, and fundraising team uh, stop all other fundraising efforts and focus on the because the uh, neighbors insisted and they had the knowledge, so we changed the trajectory, and with the help of the local military police. Um, we gathered the village chiefs and we landed like 24 of these trailers in just three days. Uh, and fundraising happened from around 100 people. Imagine that, like we couldn't, we would never manage to do this in three days in a hierarchical organization. And um, during the fires also, like we connected with experts, our friends, our networks, they came and they helped us to have this organizational structure, uh, which helped us to onboard and mobilize more volunteers. It was a very important step in terms of uh, mobilization. Uh, I'm not gonna go to the details, but the big operations that was like need assessment. Okay, what, what is needed on the field? Then logistics and procurement, fund fundraising. Basically the government was um, like, you can't fundraise without a legal entity. So what we did was we find the places that needs to, that can source the product that we need and send it the link to the donors and a uh, logistic team organized the uh, arrival of the uh, product. So that was really a big hassle for us. And we had field teams, uh, both for the fire intervention, but for also observation. Uh, the observation part was also important because the government started the fake news that fires was uh, a terrorist attack. Somebody, some people were deliberately says like sabotage or attacked and the people started to get their guns and start to um, cause some problems so but we can't go there and explain them okay this is this is not a sabotage but this is a climate change relating sub so what we did again connecting with the local military uh, police uh, we changed the structure of the observation and it helped us uh, build a new dialogue as well. And also animal rescue team and local coordination was other part of the efforts. Uh, let's see, so this is, um, oops, sorry. Uh, this is basically the uh, military, uh, military station. 
and they let us use as a logistic center. Sounds are, let's see. And this is the part where held where they hold the prison prisoners, but it became a, a storage unit, and people spent like eight hours, ten hours here. Um, and the other part that we filled the gap was that um, you can see here. Um, The fire trucks needed to have at least four people to operate effectively, but because of the budget cuts and misallocations of the resources, all the trucks had only two people. So volunteers fill that gap, and these are the young kite surf uh, teacher and young community in Akyaka who are uh, helping the uh, firefighters. So like one of the most important learning for me was that diversity was our strength and to be able to have that, I mean, I even joke about this. If I can, we can develop a diversity score and forecast the effectiveness of a community-led organization. Because if you talk about uh, disaster preparedness and response, you need everyone. You can't be just the volunteers because volunteers concept is a privileged uh, urban concept. It doesn't have a relevancy in the village. So you need to have a solidarity across all demographies and all uh, community clusters. So that one of our strengths and one of the most important uh, learnings. And uh, like after uh, the disaster, we worked on a, a report and we realized that the most important thing that we had was relationships, that trust networks that already happened there. And also the key player, the bridge people who connect these networks uh, during the uh, crisis. And also competencies. Uh, even if we, you need everyone uh, on deck, if you have some special competencies that you can apply during the disaster, it changes uh, the course of and know-how and effectiveness of the organization. Uh, so after the disaster, we had a link report. And also, uh, as Daniel mentioned, uh, this, this is... This affects you in very different levels, and especially the uh, psychology that affected the parents, the young, the child, everyone. So we had a, 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 a social a social social uh, first aid training, and also we field visits and social activities. But and the learning report was important for us because it provided the accountability and uh, transparency for us because we were able to uh, provide a list of the equipment that we uh, distributed to the region uh, with a complete report. So that was important. And also, since we don't have any legal entity, uh, we use the report to have a, a mainstream PR relations to build legitimacy. It was also important for us uh, before we start to this summer's prepare, uh, preparedness. And uh, in the winter time, we started with the uh, resource mapping with the local NGOs and municipality. And then we developed a blueprint with the village chiefs and volunteers in a workshop. And then the sec uh, third step was we need a decision-making and organizational structure that both easy to implement and easy to uh, uh, execute. So when we look at how we can solve this, we saw that sociocracy 
was basically what we did during the disaster organically. So we developed this organizational structure and then we started trainings on first aid and forest fires. And also we use that blueprint to map the neighborhoods in terms of the risks and the resources. Here are some photos that we like we visited the neighborhoods and uh, we met with the village chiefs and uh, uh, neighbors here. So we have uh, 90 minutes of structured conversation blueprint for our uh, volunteers to exit when they visit the villages. And um, we also developed an organizational driver to be able to align all these uh, autonomous neighborhoods and the working groups. So our organization driver is basically, we need to put out the fire in first 15 minutes. And like, how are we gonna do that? Neighbors needs to be, have equipped and ready for that intervention. So these are, this is our uh, organizational structure uh, based on the sociocracy. And uh, it is very dynamic and um, every uh, circle has at least three, four uh, people here. And what we have here also a, a communication and a very good Instagram and WhatsApp strategy on the uh, red uh, first fire of the season was put up by the youth in the village. So we got, uh, we met with them and we interviewed with them. And uh, actually, we started to develop a project with them now. And we got training from the uh, director of the forestry. And also, we got first aid uh, training and also like um, garbage collection meetings regularly during the uh, high risk season. And one of the other things that we developed was also uh, our technology work group connected with. Um, experts uh, and the local university here, we developed this Telegram chatbot to map the risks and resources. And we have this dashboard that we are using and all of the data that we collected is here on an Airtable database. And this is like, we have the risk, we have the uh, resources and the needs and the uh, the communication information of the uh, people. So during this summer, we had only uh, four fires, luckily, in the region. And this the database was so crucial to mobilize people. Uh, I mean, we have a long way to go. And one of the things that we are working on right now is training simulation. Um, so it start, it's in Turkish, sorry, but it's basically... Um, based on your role in your neighborhood, it says that, okay, you see the smoke and what is your next step? And you uh, call the number, then what's your next step? So this is kind of like a training simulation that one of our friends in uh, Doctors Without Boards helped us in his uh, surplus time. And um, yeah, this is, uh, and, Next, for the next year, this winter, we already in touch with other civil initiative, initiatives in the region, and we are working on a meeting in, a, in uh, our region to be able to share these learns and tools with other initiatives, because based on the region and the context, every civil initiative has different strengths. So if we will take to combine those um, learnings, we will have a uh, wider solidarity in the region. And just to mention about since we became, not just for the disaster, but we became neighbors, friends, and that solidarity had us became this fertile ground for other projects such as in uh, December, we helped a local heirloom seed project and we did a local youth uh, slow food camp 
with uh, university students and uh, the young people who live in the village. And also we launch a young farm program, uh, which that one um, young farmer is learning uh, to apply regenerative agriculture practices. And we hope that he will become a role model and also help us to fuse the regenerative farming practices uh, in the village. And uh, so these are the, some of the projects that we've been uh, working on. And um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. And um, for me to see, I've been waiting for these disasters for last uh, six years, seven years. And uh, I was kind of like stuck in a place that how we can survive from all these. And I knew intellectually that solidarity and collection was important, but experiencing that and embodying that um, relationship and trust um, had me change both professionally and uh, personally. And I'm gonna stop now. Thank you for the opportunity. I couldn't follow the chat, but yeah. Does it make sense? Um, but uh, I don't know how others are reacting, uh, but I I'll just say, whoa. <laughs> uh, the, thing, the moment that I got most impressed was 24 trailers in three days. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, two, well, uh, go ahead with what you want to say, but two two things. One, Shafak asks if uh, you'll have your presentation, if that's shareable, um, if you can email it. Um, and uh, they shared it and asked in Turkish. Uh, and so if there is a Turkish translation, let us know. And if not, we can maybe do some translation uh, for some of the materials. But um, it's an incredible array of, of self-organizing that happened. Um, and I found a lot of pieces that I was taking notes as an organizer about, oh, this, that system that you built. Um, and I'm curious if you could say more about just how some of those unfolded. So sometimes when self-organizing happens, it can look like magic uh, because it's like, oh, people just, they're just doing things. But also there's a way in which like some people, for example, play a coordination role or some of the different, so just, um, de -mag ma magic it for a moment. It is also magical, but also uh, make it a little, bring us a little bit more about how some of the, those networks unfolded to make that happen. I think one of the things that, um, you know, in Turkey, the uh, OECD charts and statistics, the polarization is uh, top five. Uh, and uh, when you think about like, you wouldn't expect something like this happen in Turkey because of that polarization. Uh, but the love of the nature and to be able to extend this nature's presence to uh, next generations was a, a, a combining and like uh, becoming a shared pur purpose. Like, um, and we have like lesbian couples convincing the police, local military police, you know? And like, and all the biases that people have, like the village people had a lot of biases towards the newly uh, migrated urban people. But once you have that shared purpose, at that moment, when you look at in the eye of your neighbor with that same aim, then something started to change. And also I think one of the most important role that people play that the ones who are really calm and really have uh, empathy towards others, those are the ones who connect that bridges for us. So like in our core team, as you said, very magically, I sometimes I say that the, the, the this big forest fire became a campfire that we gather around in a circle and become 
and remember our enemy cultures, you know, like, uh, and it, it demolished all of the um, polarization and uh, biases and, uh, and it's still going now, you know, like, uh, that's why we emphasize that our strength comes from the, our diversity, you know, like, that is the most important part. And I'm not very happy about this volunteer concept because it doesn't work in my opinion. And since we are talking about this Web3 blockchain new economy shit, you know, so uh, we need to be able to compensate the this care work that David Graeber also mentions, you know, right now capitalism causing these problems and they are trying to solve uh, the problem that caused by that mechanism with the volunteer, I don't believe in that. So uh, we are working on how we can utilize blockchain and need funding mechanisms as well. Um, yeah. Great. Um, thank you for that. And, and uh more people are asking for the slides, so you'll definitely have to share the slides. Um, and another just question about how you, I, I think one thing that I saw in the story uh, that you're talking about is um, uh, just how, as you say, lots of people sort of came in in a moment of a, of a serious need and immediate impact politics in some ways went to the wayside. It didn't disappear at all, but it, in some ways it steps aside where you can use a, 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 a place where people are waiting for prison as a spot for organizing. Um, and something that like Kara was talking about is sort of the, the feelings of hope and hopelessness. And I think one thing that happens is in these moments when we have an impact, uh, spaces can open up where communities can also, they can collapse, they can also strengthen. And so you're signaling to us some of the ways that they can strengthen. And that's by both bringing an organizing approach that's very broad and very open. Uh, and I also hear bringing, uh, also serving people's immediate needs. And so dealing with very practical questions. And so we're not up here talking at a very high level, but a very practical, how can we assist you in protecting your home? How can we assist you in putting out a fire? How can we find four people to find 24 trailers in three days um, and find four people to staff each of those? What are um, any other things that you feel uh, clear about, like maybe as one individual in, who maybe we don't have a whole system set up, but what does one individual do that assists to uh, uh, to help get into that terrain, to help us organize? If I'm just one person and I know two neighbors, what's that mm -hmm. starting spot to help do that self-organizing? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Great question, actually, because like usually like people like us in this call are not very uh, surrounded people like us. You know, we are alone in the neighborhood, we are alone in the company, we are alone in uh, some organizations. But for this, uh, if you go to your neighbor and just talk about the risks and resources, like, okay, what are the risks in our region, right? In our neighborhood, uh, what are the risks that we should prepare for? And also what are the resources we have in case something happens and if you would need to use that. I think disasters is uh, disasters are um, like great conversation openers, you know, like it is the perfect way to start a conversation in your neighborhood about uh, to be prepared, you know? And during these disaster times, you know, in Greek, ancient Greek time has two structures like Kairos and Kronos. You know, like the Kairos is different while experiencing right now. And during disaster, I think the Kairos opening up and there is more possibilities, more emerging futures that are, that are waiting to born. And if you would, even one person 
go to your neighbor and start that conversation. I mean, at least you can see that you are not alone. I mean, <laughs> that is one thing. And also like, um, even this winter, I would say that like, even this winter that the people we worked together during the disaster, the majority opinion was, okay, this was a 100 year event. Maybe it's not gonna happen again. So we like even that fresh memory of three months, people were still, you know, maybe it's not gonna happen again. And we lost momentum on March and April. And we were like pushing, like we had like this core people. And uh, also uh, that's why I don't believe in volunteers because in, during that uh, winter time and March and April, we worked with village chiefs. We worked with the locals, you know, like because they knew if something happened, it's gonna end. But you know that that mindset, you need to connect. it. This is like community-led, community-based. Anything is hard work, and you need to you need to be there completely, one hundred percent. But that is even if you uh, progress is slow. It's really uh, very strong, uh, very powerful. And uh, luckily we are in the end of the, this summer season. And like, we are, that's why we're very happy and we end up not uh, losing any uh, area in Akiaka. Uh, but we had like four fires and the structure that we built worked really good. People were not helpless and people like people knew what they supposed to do in case of that emergency. And if you have family members, if you have like, if you are father, if you are mother, if you like with your loved ones, for cat, for your dog, best thing that you can do is be prepared and just start the conversation with your neighbor. Excellent. Thank you so much. Any any last words that you want to offer, and then we'll uh, go over to Hilda to share about some of the work that she's been doing. Yeah, just I want to say that like we have I I was really stuck between the nihilism or depression because of the, the collapse narrative, but now I see a third way, and that is the solidarity, and it just starts uh conversation it's and even if small and local um uh, it works and it helps and it's very transformative and thank you thank you so much buddha um so uh we're gonna turn to hilda um hilda if you can uh come off mute and on your video um we're gonna get to hear from hilda who uh there are many of us who are, are are fans of Hilda for quite a while for the work that she's been doing on uh, founding FSS in Uganda and being a spokesperson and, and just being a very powerful uh, speaker and engaging. And so we're excited to hear from you about uh, how, how you and your community have been responding to climate impacts and, and the lessons that you're bringing with us. Um, so again, I, I might interrupt just to ask a few questions along the way, but otherwise um, I'll... I'll kick it over to you, Hilda, and so excited. Thank you for joining us. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Uh, your video isn't working very well, so but go ahead and and begin. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much, Damia. I'm glad to be here. Hello to everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. According to where you're based, my name is Hila, and I come from Uganda. I come from a country that the colonialists once called the Pearl of Africa. I come from a country whose 
ask what glorious but present is uncertain. I come from a country which has vast rainforests, it has birds flying, it has wildlife, it has waterfalls and many fascinating flora and fauna. And in most cases, tourists travel from developed countries to my country to frequently watch these things. I come from a country that is filled with rivers and lakes, swamps and wetlands. And this country had copper, but people of my generation are only seeing empty copper miles thanks to the British who exhaustively exploited it and developed themselves. My country is called Uganda and it's found in the east of Africa. It's one of the poorest countries and that are very vulnerable to the impact of climate change. But with resources that continue to develop to the already developed countries. I come from a country with diverse culture and tradition and my country has over 50 languages. But thanks to the British, we were made to speak one language, and that is English, so the other languages can be forgotten. By forgetting our language, is giving up on our culture and our roots. In my culture, we have clans, we, and every clan has a totem, and every totem has its own beliefs and norms. And these clans are differentiated on animal bases such as cow clan, lion clan, monkey clan, frog, and so on. So I come from a uh, Buganda culture and my clan is Kalabash monkey. One of our norms is that you are not supposed to eat your clan, but rather you have to take care of it, you have to love it. And this is done to preserve nature because uh, you cannot hurt what you love. So you cannot hurt your clan or your totem. And this is how preservation, conservation, and sustainability is practiced in my culture. And 20 years back, having a tree in every family's compound was a norm. And we believed that our traditional spirits lived in these trees and that many, and many people respected these trees. So they could not cut them down for whatever reason. But this is not the case anymore. And that is why there is increased need for us to practice it. I'm speaking about this right now because there are a lot of climate catastrophes that are happening in the world. We are facing the biggest challenge humanity has ever faced. And we have a lot of questions about what do we need to do what has to be done. We are forgetting what we used to do that didn't lead us into what we are doing right now. These are this indigenous knowledge and practices that we used to do. But we are so much stuck on development that we forget what we used to do. I put together a, a short presentation. You can share my screen. Uh, this is country where I come from, and it has, like you can see, a lot of uh, agriculture, forests, you know, lakes, uh, lake, like Lake Victoria, which is the biggest uh, freshwater body in Africa, and it's also the second biggest in the whole world. We have forests. Uh, like you can see here or what I'm talking about and uh, the rate of forest cover so yeah of forest cover loss in my country right now stands at about 2.6 percent annually and this is one of the highest in the world and most 30 uh, percent of the forests are on protected land but then 70 percent is on private land 
that means there's more risk of these forests being cut down uh, for human activities, you know, for construction, uh, for agriculture, and many other reasons. Climate variability, which is becoming rampant, has led to low productivity of crops, rampant droughts. In some areas, there are floods. Uh, recently, in the eastern part of my country, we, ex we experienced floods and lost about 30 people. And uh, this is a very big challenge because this is a mountainous area. And uh, there are rivers that come from uh, way where the mountain starts from. And these rivers uh, burst their banks because we were experiencing heavy rains. And because of this, people's houses were flooded. Uh, people's plantations were submerged. And it goes on and on. It happens each and every year. My country keeps facing these floods. And uh, in the northern part, it's a different story because there it's uh, a question of drought. There is a lot of drought in the northern parts uh, of the country around here. And these droughts affect close to 2.4 million people. And it's estimated, uh, the estimated loss and damage value up to 1.2 billion, equivalent to 7.5% of Uganda's or my 20 GDP. The effects that we experience. So, uh, as we may know, Africa contributes less than 4% of the global greenhouse emissions, but it's one of the continents that are facing first hand effects of climate change. And we continue to face this as the root cause of uh, the, the climate crisis is still happening and it's still going on. Global greenhouse emissions are continuing to increase even at a time when we have to limit them in order to stay alive. This is a picture of uh, the droughts that are happening in the Horn of Africa and the floods that are happening in Uganda. So this here is my village. It's where I come from. I remember uh, traveling to my home village there. It's in Masaka district when I was little. And all I could see on the way were swamps, forests, and bushes. And more often, my grandmother used to send us food in the city from our plantation because there was plenty in the garden. As time went on, things started to change. Food became scarce and very expensive. Swamps and forests were cleared for rice and sugarcane growing by the so-called investors. Global warming causing unpredictable seasons, disastrous weather conditions, characterized by heavy rains, strong winds, there were high temperatures, that threw down our crops, dried our streams, and withered plantations, making it hard for agriculture, which was our source of survival. As more and more conditions came up, we had my family had to sell off part of our land so as to survive. So we started buying food from the city instead to take to take to my grandmother in the village because there wasn't. Uh, more food coming from the village to, su to support us or to sustain us. So we had to buy food expensively from the city and send to her, which was not the case before. Uganda's past was glorious, but the present is polluted. I do not know about climate change until I attended a dialogue at my university and the speaker mentioned that very little is being done to tackle climate change. And at that moment, I felt very terrible. And even uh, 
more determined and responsible to be part of a solution. And since then, I joined millions of other young people fighting for climate justice globally. And from that time, I made a decision. I refused to be silent about the global crisis, about the greatest challenge that we are facing. And so I stood up. And as I speak to you right now, investors are clearing our forests for sugarcane plantations in the name of development. What uh, we've been working on lately is the East African crude oil pipeline. Oil giant Total Energy is yet to host a 1,443 kilometer long pipeline. It will be the world's longest heated crude oil pipeline. I have pictures of it right here. Yeah, uh, this is the pipeline that I'm talking about. It will start from Hoima in Uganda and to the port of Tanga in Tanzania. It will be the world's longest heated crude oil pipeline and it is a climate bomb. It is passing through major national parks it's passing through wetlands, rivers, it's passing through lakes, it's putting millions of lives at risk. A third of this pipeline is, is, is expected to be built around Lake Victoria Basin, as you can see uh, this area. So, and uh, this lake is shared among uh, many countries in Africa, not only that we, but it's also the source of the longest river, Nile, and it goes all the way through Egypt. A lot of people are at risk if, uh, in case of an oil spill happens from this pipeline, the eco pipeline, because it will cause, uh, it will affect Lake Victoria, which benefits over 40 million people's lives. And and uh, many because the project has not uh, completely compensated the people. Those who were able to get compensation, uh, it has been halfway and not fully paid. And that is a very big challenge because they are not able to meet their regular lives or to meet their regular needs and live a normal life like they have been living even before the pipeline. Many people are, uh, are at risk, many people's lives are at risk, and uh, many communities have been affected, many cultures have been affected, uh, have been hurt, traditions are being lost due to this. And this is what is happening in the communities. So most of the people's land has been taken and that time during the COVID pandemic uh, in 2020, people started to speak up because they didn't have land to grow crops because most of the land that was uh, taken from them um, Total, uh, as a company, promised to pay these people, so it acquired land from the public and people were refused to use their land even when compensation uh, had not been made. So during the COVID pandemic, many people were affected because they would not access their lands and yet they were not paid. So people started to speak up about this and they say they could at least grow crops that are, do not take over three months uh, to harvest. So very small crops were grown, like beans, that do not take a long, a long time. This pipeline is uh, going to affect a lot of biodiversity, which includes lakes and rivers. Uganda is a country that is blessed with many lakes and rivers. And where this pipeline uh, uh, in the previous place, where this pipeline is starting here is a lake. There are many rivers around here and also this is a, a lake. So Uganda uh, 
as a country. Benefit a lot from fisheries, and it's, it contributes a lot to our economy, lives. It's going to raise a lot of livelihood, life to water and other resources around this. That means many people will not be able to get clean water. We won't be able to carry out activities like fishing, agriculture. Uh, our health will be affected, and many other things. Other biodiversity is at risk. Uh, this pipeline is passing through national parks, uh, game reserves, and one of the oldest, which is Makshan Falls, one of the one of Uganda's oldest national parks. It has very many animals. It has uh, elephants. It has buffaloes. It has chimpanzees. It has snakes, birds, crawlers. All kinds of animals are already at risk. Uh, also to mention this pipeline passes through forests, one of Uganda's only left tropical forests, that is Pogoma forest, is going to be affected. And this forest is already facing risk from sugarcane growers, uh, like I said, investors who are coming in to take these natural resources away from the people. in the name of this means and so investors are already clearing up this forest another risk from that is African crude oil pipeline because it will be cleared to create space for this pipeline which is not good as uh, animals from this forest are already running away and encroaching in people's plantations and uh, and houses causing destructions, and because of self-defense, people are also killing these animals and thus reducing their numbers. So uh, the animals are a threat to the humans and the humans are a threat to the animals. So it's because of this type that wants to be constructed because of the all the, the bad species in Uganda, the biodiversity. Uganda is a country that is rich in biodiversity in nature. There are lots and lots of birds. So as activists, as youth, as young people, we are mobilizing to, to create an end to this pipeline because of the effects it has on our country, on our land, on the people, on nature, but also on the world at large. This pipeline is expected to emit over 34.3 million metric tons of carbon a year. And that is only in the exploration part. That means there's more carbon to be emitted throughout the transportation uh, period. And this is a risk to all of us because at a time like this, the world is looking at uh, reducing carbon emissions in order to stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius. But projects like this are continuing to be constructed and they are proving to be a source of carbon emissions. So this is a very, it's a very ridiculous project. And uh, as Nemo explained in, the, in his presentation, that many European countries are now looking at Africa as a new source of oil and gas. But uh, we just want to be clear on this, that the African or Africa is not known for oil production, is not known for gas production. We are known for agriculture. And it's agriculture that can uh, make our survival. It's agriculture that we know how what to how to do it, and it's agriculture that we need. If there is any form of development, it should be a just transition from fossil fuel, from fossil fuels to renewable energy. And some of these actions have been done locally, but also internationally. 
uh, there's a Stop ECOP coalition, which has over uh, 20 organizations, both local and global. And we work together to address the issues around the East African crude oil pipeline. A lot has been done. Uh, emails have been sent to different uh, stakeholders. Uh, Total, Total as a company approached uh, different bankers and insurers asking them for support in this project. And uh, we have been having different actions that included meeting these banks and these insurance companies and talking to them about uh, the dangers the project is uh, the dangers the project is, uh, is bringing on the people and how the project is violating human rights because uh, many people's rights are not respected. Activists who speak up, activists on human rights defenders who try to speak up against this project are silenced in different ways. Sometimes they are arrested, sometimes they are detained, sometimes they are harassed, and uh, sometimes they are threatened. You just uh, get this message, someone telling you stop doing this or else something bad will happen. So there are a lot of insecurities with uh, this project. And if a project has such a beginning, a beginning of arrests, a beginning of detaining people, a beginning of human rights violations, then that means that project is not good for the people. And that is why we are trying to create awareness about this. And we've been working together with other activists internationally to create awareness, especially in Europe and in France, because Total is a French company. And we created awareness uh, about this ECOP in uh, France to get um, support, to get to create solidarity around us, and also so that we have different actions happening around the world especially in these countries that have more freedom than us. In Uganda, it's not safe to have, for example, a climate strike. And um, you can be arrested, you can be detained, you can be shot. So we work with other activists abroad who can have these actions or uh, like the climate strikes freely without risking their lives, without risking uh, without risking the plans, without risking anything. And we continue to speak up about uh, this East African crude oil pipeline to create awareness among the people, both locally and also internationally. And our biggest challenge locally is that uh, many people know about the dangers or the effects that the pipeline has uh, the government and the media and since the media is uh, governed by the government there is even a bigger risk of people misunderstanding uh, what what uh, the pipeline is all about and I'll just There's even a bigger risk of uh, the picture that people have about the pipeline because uh, they think that the pipeline is a source of, uh, you know, money is going to bring a lot of money to the country, but which is not the case because the pipeline only offers very few jobs and these jobs are uh, for a short time. They are just temporary jobs. And our biggest challenge is changing the mindsets of the public and having them to to get the right information to understand the real um, the real actions that are taking place on ground and how people on the ground are being affected by this pipeline and um, many people are in denial because they think uh, this project will benefit each and everyone and yet this project is just meant to benefit uh, a few people who are having higher positions in the government. But what is happening on ground is that 
the people that are being affected do not have uh, a lot of space to share because they fear risking their lives because whoever talks about this project on the ground is threatened, is harassed, is detained. And this is the kind of, uh, this is another challenge that we face that activists who want to support and you know join these activities have this fear that their lives are, will be at risk uh, because of the threats that are going going because of the arrests. But we try to gather youth, uh, gather youth and carry out a lot of sensitizations. We talk to people in different languages. Uh, we try to explain to people the truth about the eco project and uh, the threats it has and why that and how the government is miscommunicating or misinforming and all that and we continue to do this in universities because universities have uh, a, a big number of people you can talk to big numbers of people at the same time and also because there's a percentage a good percentage of land people so they uh, they can understand this information uh, quickly and these people can also uh, talk to other people in their families about this project, about what is happening on the ground so that we can build a movement of youth who are spreading climate awareness, who are spreading uh, the right information about the East African crude oil pipeline, and doing different actions together so that uh, we can stop this pipeline. And what we've been able to rally is uh, first in building the number because it's we are so many people speaking up about the East African crude oil pipeline, then that increases our security. So there's less risk in numbers as they won't, for example, detain over 1,000 or 2,000 people in a police station so that is what we try to tell the people and uh, also it has been very difficult to explain to people who do not have any clue about climate change and they are very many in Uganda because climate change is not taught in school so it's very hard for them to understand and what we do is we tell a story on what is happening in people's lives right now. So, for example, if you go to a region that's been affected by floods, you talk to them about what uh, you, you try to explain climate change in a way that they understand or that they feel. So you will use that as an example to help them understand what you are trying to communicate. And this has helped us in getting more people on board but also helping them understand easily what climate change is or what their role in combating climate change is by relating on the things that they understand or the challenges that they are facing at uh, that exact moment. And, uh, <clears throat> Sorry, I'm going to interrupt and say thank you, Hilda, um, for your presentation. Uh, I think many of us may have caught the heartbeat that what you're doing involves risk, uh, in fact, and that given the political situation, it's such a, uh, it, it's the kind of situation in which you, you said it, that there's great risk, and yet with numbers, uh, it actually supports us. And so I appreciate that you sharing stories of both the place that you come from, but also the international work that you're doing with the ECOP campaign, a campaign that connects multiple countries, uh, both those who are immediately connected to um, uh, the pipeline and, and directly impacted, but also other countries who've also been being ally and support with it. And so even just being on this call again is part of that global experience. And so we're experiencing the global experience uh, also a reflection of the international uh, lack of justice just by internet disparity. Um, and so I just, I appreciate everyone bearing with some of the moments when we couldn't hear every word, 
Uh, but we got your heartbeat and we got the message of, of what you're bringing, Hilda. And so thank you for that so much. Um, and I just, as we're, as we're heading into a close, I want to invite people to um, uh, share with us um, uh, anything that you're committing to, any lessons that you're bringing. Um, so I'm hoping that people are, are pulling things out, threads from all of the different people from Shabayan, from Nemo, from uh, Hilda, from B Buddha. Um, and so feel free to post those on the chat, some of the pieces that you're bringing and taking away that you're going to use. Um, I do again want to say thanks to all the panelists. Um, I'm, I'm reminded at this moment, uh, as I was, we were organizing these training sessions, one of my colleagues said to me, she said, look, if there's, if you speak to one person, if you can move one person to commit their life to doing work on climate change or do, believing that this work it matters, that's a success. It's not about the 10,000. I mean, if you can convince 10,000, that's good too. But if you can move one person, and I, I'm reminded about this in the spirit of, of dealing with our climate impacts, that it's about saving the people next to us. It's about protecting the people around us. It's about building a global community. But also, as Buddha said, it's about connecting with uh, just the the, the neighbor next to us. And so we're, whether we feel like we can speak to thousands or we can just speak to our neighbor, we have uh, responses available, uh, ways to act. And I'm reminded also about my own, uh, my own daughter, uh, who she, after, after the flood, um, when the flood happened, we, we canoed over to our neighbors to check in on them. And my daughter came out smiling after that experience. Uh, and she said, Daniel, I hope it floods again. She's four, uh, three at the time. But I appreciated it as a just, it, I mean, it blew my mind because I did not want it to flood and I do not want it to flood. And yet I hear Buddha telling us that, in fact, this, this moved him out of despair. Uh, I hear Nemo talking about how people are refusing to act out of fear and are still committing to justice, greater and greater justice and awareness. I hear Hilda saying, even though our government is can be repressive, even though acting can be dangerous, that actually when we build a, a circle of people, that it connects us. And so thanks for joining us for today. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, uh, we will share these chats. We will share these recordings. Um, Hilda, you seem to have a new fan. Jane wants to connect with you. Uh, and have your email address. So I hope you'll be able to connect directly. Um, and just thank you all the panelists, interpreters. I know not every moment is easy. Thank you, interpreters. Um, thank you, all the panelists again. Thank you for all the tech people and thank you everyone. So have a great night, morning, afternoon, wherever you are um, and all blessings. All right, bye everyone.